Today, we will explore the case of a young girl who disembarked from her school bus only a short distance away from her home, but mysteriously vanished without leaving a trace. As the authorities initiated their investigation, they stumbled upon unsettling clues and encountered numerous unforeseen turns of events. The quest for answers extended over several years until detectives ultimately unraveled the truth behind her disappearance. Angie Hausman was born on February 18, 1984, in St. Louis, Missouri. Her father departed the family before her birth, and she never had the opportunity to know him. When Angie turned one year old, her mother remarried a man named Ronald, and they welcomed a son together. Angie and her younger brother shared a strong bond, and she held great affection for him. Angie possessed a laid-back nature, always seeking companionship with those around her. Her family resided in a tranquil suburban neighborhood of St. Louis. In 1993, at the age of nine, Angie attended fourth grade at an elementary school situated just slightly over a mile away from her residence. To reach her destination, she used to ride a bus from the nearest stop, and her parents felt relatively at ease allowing her to go alone because it was only a short distance from their house. Typically, after school, Angie would walk to the bus stop, accompanied by some of the nailhood kids. They were supervised by several parents who watched from their windows along the road. This practice became a customary way for the neighbors to ensure the children's safe journey from the bus stop to their homes. On November 18th, Angie followed her usual routine by going to school and finishing around 3 o'clock p.m. She boarded the school bus with a few of the neighborhood kids and they walked home together. However, the other kids lived closer to the bus stop, leaving Angie alone halfway through the journey. Although it was only a few minutes' walk, time passed and Angie did not show up. Concerned, Angie's parents began to worry after half an hour had passed. While she often stopped to chat with the other kids, it had never taken this long before. Her mother and stepfather decided to go outside and walk along the route from their house to the bus stop. They spoke with other kids from the same school, who confirmed that Angie had arrived with them and headed towards home. The parents also spoke with neighbors who usually kept an eye on the kids from their windows, but both women were occupied that day and did not witness anything. Angie's parents and their friends swiftly initiated a search, scouring the area along the route from the bus stop to Angie's home. This search continued into the evening, and as darkness fell, Angie's parents made the decision to contact the police. The officers promptly joined the search. Given the cold weather, it seemed unlikely that Angie would have wandered off on her own, prompting the police to initially explore worst-case scenarios. In addition to their heightened concern, there was another recent incident just ten days prior. In a nearby area, an unknown perpetrator had almost abducted an eleven-year-old girl. He approached her as she disembarked from the school bus and tried to pull her into the bushes, but she managed to escape. Since the assailant was still at large, the police considered the possibility of his involvement in Angie's disappearance. Canine units were called in, and the dogs picked up Angie's scent near the bus stop. They tracked it for about halfway to her house before losing it abruptly. This suggested that Angie may have entered a vehicle at that point, further indicating a potential abduction. The police also deployed helicopters with thermal sensors and searched the banks of a small stream near Angie's home, but they found neither the girl nor her belongings. Unfortunately, the initial day of searching yielded no results. By morning, the police turned to the media and information about Angie's disappearance quickly spread throughout the city. Within just one day, the police department received over 300 calls. To handle this influx of leads, they had to involve more than 20 new officers. However, despite all these leads, they were unable to locate the girl. Detectives explored all possible scenarios and from the early days began scrutinizing Angie's stepfather. The man maintained his innocence and insisted he would never harm her. 
he willingly agreed to a polygraph test and any other checks to prove his innocence and redirect the police's focus towards finding Angie. Investigators also located Angie's biological father, and during their investigation, they discovered something peculiar. The man had never interacted with his daughter, but according to her mother, he had driven past their house multiple times, observing Angie playing outside. Detectives found this behavior suspicious, but the man had a solid alibi. On the third day, the FBI joined the case, and the police department allocated even more officers to it. They all understood that something terrible must have occurred to Angie. She simply couldn't have survived the harsh conditions of the streets during such frigid weather. At a certain point, the police received a tip regarding a potential suspect. A witness reported seeing a suspicious man driving a blue sedan slowly through Angie's neighborhood. The description matched that of the girl, who had narrowly escaped an abduction just ten days prior to Angie's vanishing. The investigators decided to create a composite sketch of this individual, which was then featured in the news. Thousands of flyers were distributed by volunteers, yet the identity of this man remained unknown. Eventually, Angie's disappearance gained national attention and made its way onto television, resulting in an influx of leads. The police diligently examined each one, but unfortunately, none of them brought them any closer to finding Angie. Due to the heightened public interest in the case, psychics quickly became involved, reaching out to Angie's family and sharing their alleged visions. One of them even claimed that the girl was alive and provided a specific location where she was supposedly being held, a large national park located 25 miles away from Angie's home. However, the detectives chose not to pay attention to these claims. In an effort to gather more information, a reward of $10,000 was offered for any details about Angie's whereabouts, leading to an increase in tips. During the investigation, the detectives stumbled upon a rather disturbing fact. A few days prior to her disappearance, Angie had mentioned to her teacher that she was planning to go on a nature trip with her uncle. The peculiar part was that Angie had no actual uncle, and her parents were unaware of what she meant by that statement. The investigators considered the possibility that Angie may have known her abductor prior to the incident and referred to him as her uncle during her conversation with the teacher. However, they were unable to find any information about this mysterious man. In the following days, the detectives made no significant progress, but everything changed on November 27th, nine days after Angie's disappearance, when a hunter contacted the police. He had arrived at the National Park and discovered a human body in the woods. Upon reaching the location, the police were confronted with a horrifying scene. The lifeless body of a young girl was discovered, bound to a tree with no clothing, her head completely covered in tape except for her nose. Additionally, her hands were restrained with handcuffs. In close proximity to the scene, a bag containing personal items, including notebooks with the girl's name, was found, leading the police to identify the victim as Angie. The body was then handed over to medical examiners, who uncovered even more disturbing details. Upon removing the tape from her head, experts discovered a piece of underwear in her mouth. Furthermore, it was determined that Angie had tragically passed away just a few hours prior to the discovery, indicating that she had been held captive for a horrifying nine days before being brought to this location, where she ultimately succumbed to the freezing temperatures. Forensic analysts meticulously examined all the items recovered from the crime scene, managing to find a fingerprint on the tape used to wrap Angie's head. Despite their efforts to find a match in the database and among various suspects, no leads were generated. Following the discovery of the body, the police allocated additional resources to the investigation. The local community was left in shock by the heinousness of the crime, resulting in heightened concerns for the safety of their children. Parents began escorting their children everywhere, meeting them at bus stops and keeping them within sight at all times. Just a few days after Angie's tragic fate came to light, 
the community's fears were further intensified when a 10-year-old girl named Casey went missing on December 1st. Casey resided in a neighboring town, a mere 10 miles away from Angie's residence. She had asked her mother for permission to visit friends who lived just a few hundred yards away, but she never arrived at their house. Casey vanished and wrote, and despite the police's efforts, she could not be located. Detectives began to fear the possibility of a serial killer being responsible for both abductions, although they lacked any concrete evidence to support this theory. Ten days later, Casey's lifeless body was discovered in St. Louis, concealed beneath the cover of two bed sheets and a pink curtain. The cause of her tragic demise was attributed to multiple severe blows to her head. Despite their relentless efforts, the astute detectives were unable to unearth any substantial clues that could lead them to the perpetrator. As their investigation progressed, doubts began to creep into their minds, questioning whether the same individual responsible for Casey's murder was also accountable for Angie's untimely death. The dissimilarity in the nature of these heinous crimes prompted the detectives to contemplate the unsettling possibility of confronting two distinct murderers. Coincidentally, during the same month, the diligent detectives managed to identify a man who had recently attempted to abduct a young girl just days before Angie's disappearance. This man was none other than Gary, a 37-year-old individual who frequently visited St. Louis for work purposes. Naturally, the detectives promptly scrutinized Gary's involvement in the two murders, only to discover that he possessed a solid alibi. It was confirmed that he was not present in the city during the time of Angie and Casey's disappearances. However, during the course of their investigation, Gary shockingly confessed to assaulting four other innocent girls. Consequently, he was sentenced to a five-year prison term serving as a small measure of justice for his despicable actions. In a remarkable turn of events, the following year in February, the diligent detectives finally experienced a breakthrough. As they stumbled upon Casey's lifeless body, they also stumbled upon a crucial piece of evidence, tire tracks in close proximity. Recognizing the significance of this discovery, the detectives promptly handed over the photographs of the tire tracks to experts, these experts astutely determined that the tracks were left behind by a pickup truck, commonly utilized by a renowned car rental company. Armed with this information, detectives conducted interviews with residents in Casey's neighborhood, specifically inquiring about any sightings of a pickup truck associated with the company in question. Fortunately, these vehicles were easily recognizable due to their vibrant brand logos which aided the detectives in their investigation. One woman provided crucial information, stating that she had seen the pickup truck near her neighbor's house approximately a week after Casey's disappearance. This led the police to a residence where a woman lived with her partner and brother. Initially, the woman denied any involvement or knowledge of the pickup truck, asserting that neither she nor her family had rented it and had no connection to the case. However, the detectives remained skeptical and obtained a search warrant for the house. During the search, they discovered traces of Casey's blood in the basement, along with the murder weapon. Further investigation revealed that the woman's brother Thomas had indeed rented the pickup truck. At first, Thomas vehemently denied any involvement in the crime. However, when confronted with the overwhelming evidence against him, he eventually confessed. According to his account, Casey had approached his door, seeking to invite his nephews to accompany her outside. Thomas invited her into the house, but instead of accepting her invitation, he led her to the basement where he attempted to assault her. When she screamed, he struck her with a heavy object and concealed her body with bed sheets. Following the murder, Thomas went to work, and upon his return, his sister informed him that she had seen the body in the basement. Shockingly, she expressed her desire to dispose of the body as quickly as possible without knowing the details of what had occurred. Due to ongoing searches and Thomas's fear of being discovered, Casey's body remained in the basement for an entire week. 
Eventually, Thomas rented the pickup truck and transported the body to St. Louis, where he left it. Thomas was ultimately sentenced to death for his heinous crime, but he passed away in prison several years later due to illnesses. In relation to Angie's case, he denied any involvement, leading the detectives to conclude that these two crimes were unrelated. Unfortunately, the investigation faced numerous obstacles, and for several months, fewer and fewer leads were coming in, causing a standstill in the case. Several years after Angie's murder, detectives encountered a new obstacle, the expiration of the monetary reward for information. This raised concerns about a decline in public assistance. However, in 2001, a generous businessman from the community stepped forward and donated $250,000 as a reward for information on Angie's case. This substantial amount of money, one of the largest at the time, resulted in a flood of tips for the police. Unfortunately, all of these leads turned out to be dead ends. This pattern continued until 2001 when detectives received an unexpected call from a prison inmate named Corey Fox. Fox confessed to over 10 murders, including Angie Hausman's. Detectives wasted no time and immediately rushed to speak with him. Fox recounted the horrifying details of how he and his friend abducted Angie from the street and kept her captive in his house for several days. Initially, their plan was to demand a ransom, but concerns about potential identification led them to choose murder instead. To the surprise of the detectives, Fox provided numerous accurate details, such as tying her to a tree and even specifying that his accomplice used her underwear as a gag. However, discrepancies arose when questioned about the manner in which they restrained her hands. Fox claimed they utilized plastic handcuffs, while in reality they employed iron ones. Detectives also uncovered evidence that Fox could not have committed certain murders to which he had confessed. As a result, the police concluded that he likely fabricated portions of his confession, potentially drawing information from extensive news coverage on Angie Hausman's case. In the summer of 2002, another incident reignited attention on Angie's case. In a different area of St. Louis, an unidentified individual abducted a six-year-old girl from her residence and tragically ended her life. Initially, the police considered the possibility of a connection to Angie's case, but it turned out to be unrelated. The perpetrator was apprehended just a few hours later, and shockingly, it was a neighbor who confessed during the interrogation. Several more years passed until 2007, when the detectives made the decision to revisit the case. Upon reviewing the documents, they noticed a peculiar detail. Shortly after the discovery of Angie's body, the police observed a parked car nearby with an individual named Roger Martin inside. When questioned about his presence, Roger claimed he had come to the area for hunting. However, a brief inspection of his vehicle by the police officer revealed the absence of any hunting equipment. This prompted the new detective team to scrutinize Roger further leading them to discover his criminal record for offences against children. Furthermore, he had assaulted one of his victims near the location where Angie's body was found. Astonishingly, all of these crimes had occurred prior to Angie's death, and this information was already in the database. However, during that time, the police had failed to thoroughly investigate Roger, prompting the new detective team to start from scratch. Roger was summoned for questioning, during which he vehemently denied any involvement in Angie's murder, insisting that his presence near the location was purely coincidental. He added that he was still at work when the girl was left there. Although the police were unable to confirm his alibi, despite a grueling nine-hour interrogation, the detectives were unable to reach any definitive conclusions. Roach's fingerprints were compared to the ones found on the tape from the victim's head, but experts determined that they did not match. As a result, Roger was released. Although the police did not rule him out as a suspect, they lacked substantial evidence to hold him. The case remained stagnant until 2018, 
when the St. Louis Police Department established a dedicated task force. The new detectives aimed to re-evaluate all existing evidence, hoping that advancements in technology since 1993 would uncover new leads. The detectives focused on three crucial pieces of evidence, the handcuffs taped from Angie's head and the underwear used to silence her. Despite numerous attempts since 1993, experts struggled to find the perpetrator's DNA on these items. Undeterred, the detectives decided to re-examine them using modern technology. Initially, they faced challenges in finding DNA on the handcuffs due to the extensive presence of the victim's blood. They then encountered another issue when they discovered that the tape had disintegrated over the years. Finally, they examined the underwear, although they had little hope of finding foreign DNA since it had been in the victim's mouth for several hours. Nonetheless, they pursued it as a last resort. Utilizing cutting-edge technology, a thorough examination of the underwear was conducted, leaving no detail unnoticed. Eventually, a significant breakthrough occurred when a small sample of unfamiliar DNA was discovered, providing enough material for analysis. Esteemed experts promptly confirmed that the DNA belonged to a male individual and expeditiously uploaded it to the FBI database. Typically, in such instances, it is quite common not to find any matches, necessitating further efforts to identify the person involved. However, luck was on the detective's side this time. Almost immediately after the DNA sample was uploaded, a complete match was found. Astonishingly, the DNA belonged to a 58-year-old man named Earl Cox, who had been incarcerated since 2003. Surprisingly, Cox had never previously come to the attention of the police in relation to Angie's case, but his criminal history was extensive. Earl's initial encounter with the law occurred during his military service in 1982 while stationed in Germany. Subsequently, he held a part-time job as a babysitter until four girls reported that he had sexually assaulted them. Earl was sentenced to eight years in prison in the United States and was subsequently discharged from the army. However, he was released early after serving only three years and relocated to St. Louis. Four years later, Earl was arrested once again when two seven-year-old girls accused him of sexual assault. Although the charges were eventually dropped due to insufficient evidence, his arrest violated the terms of his parole, resulting in an additional year of imprisonment. Following his release in 1992, he resettled in St. Louis, where his relatives resided. Unfortunately, a year later, he seemingly abducted and murdered Angie. In 2002, Earl faced yet another arrest for operating a major anonymous internet platform where predators shared explicit materials involving child abuse. The FBI had been conducting an investigation on him for some time, and Earl fell into their trap when an undercover agent, posing as a 14-year-old girl, made contact with him. Earl's initial plan to make someone his slave took a dark turn when he encountered armed FBI agents instead of the intended girl. This unexpected encounter led to his arrest. During the investigation, authorities discovered disturbing evidence on Earl's computer, including 45,000 photos of child abuse, revealing his involvement as the mastermind behind a perverse platform. This shocking revelation led to the arrest of 60 more individuals associated with the site, making it one of the largest operations against paedophiles in the country's history. In 2003, Earl was sentenced to 10 years in prison for his crimes. However, when his term ended, a judge invoked a legal loophole that allowed the detention of individuals deemed a serious threat to children, refusing to release him. Consequently, Earl remained behind bars. In 2019, a breakthrough occurred when his DNA matched the sample from Angie Hausman's case. Detectives visited Earl in prison to question him about the crime but he denied any involvement and promptly requested a lawyer. Realizing that Earl's chances of winning the case in court 
were slim due to the presence of his DNA, the police decided to take a different approach. They contacted Earl's lawyer and informed them that they would seek the death penalty for Angie's murder. However, they offered a deal. If Earl confessed to the crime, the prosecution would abandon the death penalty and instead pursue a life sentence. Earl, seemingly aware of the high probability of losing the case, reluctantly agreed to the proposed deal. The detectives then escorted him back to the prison, where he proceeded to recount his version of events. It is important to highlight that certain aspects of his narrative appeared highly implausible, but what truly mattered to the investigators was his admission of guilt for the murder. Earl asserted that on November 18, 1993, he found himself driving through the vicinity where his mother and sister resided. Unfortunately, his car unexpectedly broke down in the middle of the road. As he attempted to diagnose the issue, a school bus arrived and a group of children disembarked. While most of them headed towards their respective homes, one young girl named Angie remained behind. According to Earl, he engaged in a brief conversation with her, during which he couldn't help but notice her shivering from the cold. He extended an invitation for her to join him in his vehicle, and according to his account, she acquiesced. Subsequently, he took Angie to Burger King, provided her with sustenance, and transported her to his residence, where he subjected her to sexual assault over a span of several days. After some time had passed, he made the decision to dispose of Angie. He transported her to the location where her lifeless body would later be discovered, securing her to a tree. Allegedly, she was still alive at that particular moment. Detectives harbored doubts regarding the veracity of certain aspects of this narrative. It was evident that Angie would not have willingly accompanied a stranger, especially considering the short distance she had to traverse to reach her home. Investigators also raised concerns about the car malfunction mentioned in Earl's account. He asserted that the vehicle had stalled, yet it miraculously restarted as soon as Angie approached. It seemed far more plausible that the perpetrator had noticed Angie and promptly decided to abduct her. He could have enticed her into the car through deceitful means or even threats. This version appeared much more credible than Earl's. Nonetheless, detectives managed to obtain the crucial evidence they needed, a confession to the murder. In August 2020, he stood before a judge who sentenced him to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Regrettably, Angie's mother did not live to witness this pivotal moment as she succumbed to cancer in 2016. Her husband, Ronald, expressed to the press that Earl should have been held accountable for two murders as he believed Earl was responsible for his wife's demise. After losing her daughter, Angie's mother lost all zest for life and essentially perished. Earl's story did not conclude with the verdict. The prosecutor sought to re-examine a case involving sexual abuse of two seven-year-old girls, for which the perpetrator faced no repercussions, serving only a year in prison for violating parole. Law enforcement reached out to one of his victims, now an adult, requesting her testimony against Earl. The man, who had already been condemned to spend the remainder of his life incarcerated, confessed to his wrongdoing and received an extra ten-year imprisonment term. Following the pronouncement of the sentence, the victim addressed the court. She conveyed that despite Earl's atrocious crime, she would pursue a joyful and satisfying life while he rightfully withers away in prison. Within the home of her foster parents, a 14-year-old girl vanished without explanation. It was determined that the case was run away. The investigation was essentially shut down for 30 years at the outset because the investigating authorities failed to give the incident's circumstances and the events leading up to the escape enough consideration. The victim's relatives' perseverance and the volunteers' concern ultimately resulted in the mystery surrounding her strange disappearance being solved. In collaboration with forensic specialists, skilled investigators were able to piece together the complete story and reveal the shocking and unanticipated truth that took everyone by surprise. 
On June 23, 1974, Andrea Michelle Bauman was born in New Orleans, Louisiana. Alexis Miranda Badger was the name given to her at birth by her mother, Kathy Takanian. Kathy fled to New Orleans in 1972, at the age of 14, after hitchhiking from Virginia. She worked as a waitress to support herself. She soon got to know a young man, whom she married right away. The couple had a young daughter named Alexis. After a year and a half of living together, when Kathy was not yet 17 years old. Following the birth of the child, Kathy's marriage to her husband fell apart. He started cheating on her and showed no assistance in raising the child. Kathy, who was only 17 years old at the time, made the decision to return with her daughter to Virginia, the state where her mother resided. However, upon her arrival in Virginia, she discovered that her mother was fighting cancer and did not want to keep the child. Due to her challenging financial circumstances, Kathy had to place her nine-month-old daughter in foster care after giving her up for adoption. And shortly after, at the age of 21 months, Alexis was taken in by a Michigan-based Bowman couple and given the name Andrea. Foster care was not an ideal place for Andrea to live. Her adoptive father, Dennis Bowman, was arrested by police for assaulting a 19-year-old woman who was riding her bicycle along the road just a few years after her adoption in Ottawa County, Michigan, in 1980. He assaulted her and threatened to shoot her before dragging her into the woods to be sexually assaulted. A passing car momentarily diverted the attacker's focus, allowing the woman to somehow escape and make a hell call. Dennis was accused of the crime in 1981, and the court sentenced him to 10 years in prison. However, in 1986, he was allowed to leave prison early, having completed only half of his allotted term. Andrea had been living with her foster mother, Brenda Bauman, since she was 12 years old. In spite of Dennis' extremely serious criminal history, the parole officer permitted him to live with his foster daughter. Brenda and Dennis had a daughter, Vanessa, in 1987, and the girl's relationship with her foster father deteriorated significantly after that. Andrea Bauman told her middle school staff at the end of 1988 that she was scared to go home. They then informed the police, who spoke with the girl in an interview. She stated in the interview that she had endured physical abuse, harassment, and frequent corporal punishment at the hands of her adoptive father. A social worker gave Andrea back to the family in spite of this. Dennis and Brenda refuted all of these allegations, claiming that the girl was intentionally attempting to harm her adoptive parents as a result of her recent realization that she had been adopted as a baby. The Bowmans relocated to a mobile home in a remote area of Allegan County not long after this incident. Andrea Bowman was last observed in this location. The family filed a missing persons report on March 11, 1989. Dennis Bowman stated that he discovered his oldest daughter was missing when he got home from work in the evening. A $100 bill from a shelf next to the front door as well as a few of her possessions were gone. He claimed that the girl was a challenging adolescent who frequently got into arguments with her adoptive parents, ran away to stay the night with friends and more. Dennis and Brenda Bauman called all of the neighbors later that evening, but nobody had seen the girl that day. Few neighbors had any doubts about the official account of the runaway. The family was the subject of several rumors that surfaced over time. For instance, Andrea's wrists showed evidence of cuts when she was in middle school. While some kids talked among themselves about an attempted suicide, others claimed that Andrea had cut herself while attempting to break out of her room, where her parents had locked her. Rumors circulated that their adopted daughter was being physically abused by Dennis and Brenda, which caused her to flee the family. The girl was reported missing by the police, who then turned the case over to the juvenile department. Brenda stated that she got calls from various stores in the months after Andrea vanished, saying that people had seen her daughter alive. Investigators looked into each of these claims, but they were all unconfirmed. 
the missing girl's case received a lot of media attention. Her pictures were published in newspapers and put on display in city streets, but the investigation came to a standstill for a number of years without producing any results. As part of a social project, the American alternative rock group Soul Asylum released a music video for Runaway Train in 1993. Pictures and names of America's missing children were displayed in the video. The video gained a lot of popularity, and multiple airings on popular music channels were made. Andrea's picture was included in the version aired in Michigan, but no fresh information about the investigation surfaced despite the popularity of the version. The case's impasse was not broken until 2010 by a passionate amateur named Carl William Koppelman. Koppelman spent his leisure time researching well-known unresolved cases by cross-referencing data and gathering information from the internet. Carl Koppelman discovered a similarity between the missing Andrea Bauman and an unidentified girl who was discovered dead in a cornfield in Racine County, Wisconsin in 1999 while looking through material that was made available to the public. The girls were the same age and had similar physical features. In 1999, Andrea would have been 25 years old, the same age as the unidentified Racine girl. Besides, Andrea's former home was not far from Racine. Carl Koppelman provided this information to investigators who were persuaded enough to launch an inquiry. The police needed to test someone in Andrea's family's DNA to find out if the body of the unidentified girl belonged to her. This task proved difficult, though, because Andrea was adopted and the police at the time did not know anything about her biological family. Koppelman kept looking up information about the Bowmans online while the police looked for the girl's relatives. He once stumbled upon Andrea Bowman's social media profile. Carl sent a message and got a response a few hours later because it was a paid resource, proving the legitimacy of the profile. Kathy Takanian, Andrea Bowman's biological mother, handled the profile, it turns out. Many years ago, Kathy started looking for information about her daughter, but she was unable to find anything. When she gave up her daughter for adoption, the child welfare authorities promised her that she would be able to reunite with her child when she turned 18. But this never happened. A social worker in Norfolk, Virginia, wrote Kathy in 2012 requesting that she send in her DNA so that it could be compared to that of an unidentified girl who lived in Racine County. After her daughter vanished from the home of her adoptive parents in 1989, the police thought that this might be her daughter. After comparing birth dates and looking through lists of missing persons, Kathy's husband recognized the girl as Andrea. Kathy had been hoping to get back in touch with her daughter during this time, but instead she found out that the child she had placed for adoption back in the 1970s had vanished. Interestingly, Kathy had seen the Soul Asylum's music video for Runaway Train, which included a picture of Andrea, but she was unaware that one of the faces was that of her own daughter. After a lengthy wait, Kathy's DNA test results in 2013 showed that she was unrelated to the unidentified girl discovered in Racine County. Later, it was established by DNA analysis that Peggy Johnson was the owner of the body. Kathy took an active part in the search for Andrea after that. She set up a website, gave out t-shirts and flyers, and even promised a $25,000 reward for any information leading to the girl's whereabouts. Most importantly, Kathy tried to find out any official information about the girl's disappearance by contacting a retired Michigan detective who had been part of the investigation. Kathy was told by the detective to focus on the Bowman family members. When Kathy Takanian looked for information that was available to the public, she was startled to learn that Dennis Bauman, the family's head, had several convictions. In 1998, he was arrested for breaking into a colleague's house with the intention of stealing items, including women's underwear, in addition to the 1980 case of assaulting a young woman in the woods. He received a one-year prison sentence and restitution. According to police records, 
Dennis Bowman fit the description of a sexual offender and was deemed a possible threat to women. After discovering these facts, Kathy did not completely rule out the notion that this man was connected to Andrea's disappearance. Together, Kathy Takanian and Carl Koppelman hired Michigan-based private investigator Jeffrey Flora to look into Andrea's disappearance. After conducting his investigation and compiling all of the case's information, Detective Flora found a number of intriguing details that went beyond the previously known facts. He conducted interviews with town residents where the Bauman family resided and discovered that Andrea had a friendship with Andrew Ran, a classmate. They spent a lot of time with Andrew's parents at their house. Andrea told Andrew's mother one day that the reason she did not want to go home was that her father had mistreated her and her mother, who knew about it, had either chosen to ignore it or feigned ignorance. Even in these circumstances, meddling in another person's family matters was deemed improper at the time. As a result, Arlene Ran, Andrew's mother, suggested that Andrea consult her clergyman for advice on how to handle the circumstance. Arlene once drove Andrea home when Dennis Bauman abruptly arrived, walked up to the car, and told her not to get involved in other people's business. Fearing for her safety, Arlene made an effort to stay away from Bowman and kept the incident quiet. Andrea vanished after a few months. This information strengthened Kathy's conviction that her daughter's adoptive father was responsible for her disappearance. She gave the police every piece of information she knew, but since it was only circumstantial, the case did not move forward and the investigation once more stalled for a number of years. It was not until November 2019 that Koppelman learned of Dennis Bowman's arrest through a Michigan resident. He was made a suspect in the 1980 murder of Kathleen O'Brien Doyle, a U.S. Navy pilot's wife, and the 1980 sexual assault of the same woman when he was 31 years old. On September 11, 1980, a body was discovered murdered in her Norfolk, Virginia home. She had been stabbed and strangled. Dennis was among 30 suspects in this case. After attending a seminar in Michigan, the case's investigators made the decision to compare the suspect's DNA. The DNA from the crime scene and Dennis Berman's profile matched exactly, shocking the detectives. After being taken into custody right away, Bauman was extradited to Virginia for a trial a few months later. In 1980, while awaiting trial, he admitted to carrying out the attack. Bowman, who was 31 at the time, broke into 25-year-old Doyle's home in Norfolk, Virginia. He assaulted her with a knife, sexually abused her, and strangled her in the bedroom. Bowman confessed to the police that he was intoxicated and broke into her home with the intent to rob her. The revelation of this 40-year-old crime prompted Bowman to finally admit what happened to his adoptive daughter. In January 2020, Dennis Bowman, 71, admitted to killing Andrea while he was being held in Virginia. This took place 31 years after her disappearance. Skeletal remains were found under a layer of concrete by police on February 4, 2020, in the backyard of Bowman's home in the 3200 block of 136th Avenue in Monterey, Michigan. The discovery of human skeletal remains, likely those of Andrea Bowman, beneath a concrete slab behind the house was announced at a press conference that same day. The police needed to confirm the identity so Kathy immediately provided her DNA, which resulted in a perfect match. According to Dennis' testimony, he came home on the day Andrea died and found her packing to leave. She warned him that she would not put up with his advances any longer and that she planned to call the police once more. As they got into a fight, Dennis hit Andrea across the face. She broke her neck when she fell due to the force of the blow. Andrea's death, according to Dennis, was an accident. He declared her missing in order to hide the truth and keep his freedom for the benefit of his family and younger daughter. Dennis Bauman was formally charged by the prosecution on May 15, 2020, with first-degree child abuse, murder, and body mutilation. To stand trial on these charges, 
he was scheduled to be extradited back to Michigan. For his prior crimes, Dennis was given two life sentences in June 2020. He was also mandated to serve his time in Michigan while awaiting trial for the murder of Andrea. Due to the pandemic, the first court hearing in this case was televised live in February 2021. Brenda, Dennis's wife, was the main witness at the hearing. She recalled, sobbing, that she was positive Andrea had fled the house when she reported their daughter missing. She further disclosed that it was only after Dennis's arrest that she discovered the truth. In a phone call from jail, he admitted to her that he had buried their daughter's body in the backyard of their Montreal home. Since they were not residing in the Montreal home when Andrea vanished and the body could not have been buried there, Brenda first found it difficult to accept. But Dennis clarified that as soon as they signed the papers to buy a house, he started moving the girl's body in pieces. Brenda did not know that the cement slab in the yard was a makeshift grave marker. Despite her innocence, the tragic outcome of her actions and her husband's opportunity to act were caused by her neglect and indifference towards her daughter. She had knowledge of his criminal history and his potential for misconduct, but she made the decision to remain silent. In the Allegan County Circuit Court on December 22, 2021, Bauman entered a not guilty plea to second degree murder in relation to the passing of 40 year old Andrea. He was still going to call it an accident. Dennis received a sentence of 35 years in addition to his current term during the next hearing, which was held in February 2022. The judge gave an explanation for her choice, saying that although a life sentence for second degree murder was taken into consideration, she ultimately decided to go with a minimum 35-year sentence because parole is not guaranteed after 15 years. Despite the verdict, the girl's mother, Kathy Takenian, did not feel morally satisfied. She accused Brenda Bauman, who was also involved in the case, of enabling Dennis to carry out his heinous acts against the girl by keeping quiet. Additionally, Kathy stated that she thought Brenda might have been aware of everything from the start, and had purposefully shifted the focus of police investigation away from her husband by supplying false information about Andrea being seen to be well and alive in multiple locations. Kathy Takanian and Brenda Bowman are currently involved in a legal battle over Kathy Takanian's right to her daughter's remains. After everything that transpired, she feels that the Bowman family has no moral or legal claim over them. There are still a lot of unanswered questions and complaints about the police investigation, which was long and drawn out because it was not done correctly in the beginning, and the information that was available was not fully verified.